From the RSNA, I'm Dr. Jana Ivanitsyn, and this is Radiology Imaging Cancer. We are finally back in your feed with a special podcast episode focused on an article recently published in the journal. Today's interview was conducted by one of our fantastic trainee editorial board members, Dr. Shah Islam. Shah is a neuroradiologist and is currently a clinical research fellow in the Division of Brain Sciences at Imperial College London. Fun fact, Shai and I first met when we presented our research in the same RSNA scientific abstract session, pre-COVID, so it feels like a century ago. So I was, of course, thrilled when he more recently joined the trainee editorial board. Shai will be interviewing Dr. Edward Lin from the Department of Imaging Sciences, University of Rochester Medical Center in Rochester, New York. Dr. Lin published a very elegant article on multimodal imaging and molecular classification of head and neck paradigmas a topic I am personally very interested in, and I am sure many of you in the audience will share my enthusiasm. I hope you enjoy this podcast episode, and as always, we look forward to your feedback. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me for another Radiology Imaging Cancer podcast. My name is Dr. Shah Islam. I'm a neuroradiologist in London, and it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Edward Lin, who's an associate professor of the Department of Imaging Sciences at the University of Rochester Medical Center. He is a board certified neuroradiologist, but not only does he have expertise in imaging of the neuroaxis, he trained in head and neck imaging and currently the interim division chief of neuroradiology, the director of the neuroradiology fellowship program and head and neck imaging. Thank you, Dr. Lin for joining us. And the reason we're here today is because he wrote an excellent review article which was accepted by Imaging Cancer on head and neck paragangliomas, an update on the molecular classification, state-of-the-art imaging and management recommendations. So thank you, Dr. Lim, for joining us today. Um, Firstly, congratulations on the paper. Uh, We all loved it on the editorial board, and which is why we accepted it. And we think it's a paper that has great um, clinical impact um, it was just really well written and really, really good figures um, and illustrations. So without further ado, would you be able to just give us a brief summary of the paper um, and the nuances around it and its clinical impact? Thank you, um, Dr. Islam and uh, the editorial board at Radiology Imaging Cancer uh, for the opportunity first um, to publish this paper in your journal and second, uh, to share this paper with everyone today. And uh, first, I want to thank everyone on this project um, who contributed so much of their time, effort, and expertise in creating this final product, um, including the many reviewers along the way who provided comments during the review process. To summarize this paper, um, paragangliomas are uncommon hypervascular neuroendocrine tumors that arise from the paraganglia, which derive embryologically from neural crest cells associated with the autonomic nervous system. Paragangliomas are genetically driven tumors with up to 40% containing germline mutations. The Cancer Genome Atlas program has uncovered at least 21 driver mutations, which is more than any other endocrine tumor, and at least three molecular clusters. The most relevant to head and neck paragangliomas is the pseudohypoxia cluster. Mutations in the pseudohypoxia cluster involve the von Hippel-Lindau gene and genes encoding the enzymes succinate, dehydrogenase, and fumarate hydratase, which function in the tricarboxylic acid cycle. Mutations of these enzymes lead to elevated levels of hypoxia-inducible factor alpha, a protein normally associated with hypoxic states and erythropoietin transcription. These mutations ultimately mimic a hypoxic state under normal oxygen concentrations, hence the pseudohypoxia name, and ultimately result in tumor angiogenesis and cellular proliferation. Succinate dehydrogenase, or SDH, contains multiple subunits. Mutations associated with subunit B, as in boy, are found in pheochromocytomas and extraadrenal paragangliomas, including those in the head and neck, and are associated with approximately 25% incidence of metastasis, the highest of all paraganglioma-associated mutations. SDH subunit D, as in David, is also found in head and neck paragangliomas, 
and had the highest risk for multifocal disease. This increased risk for multifocal disease and metastasis in which patients have a 50% five-year survival rate has led to endocrine society and North American neuroendocrine tumor guidelines to recommend genetic testing and counseling on all patients with pheochromocytomas and extra adrenal paragangliomas. Due to its superior detectability of paragangliomas, including in the head and neck with sensitivities over 90%, Gallium 68 dotate scans are the study of choice for patients with a known head and neck paraganglioma, particularly with underlying SDH mutation, as well as patients with potential for metastatic or multifocal disease, such as patients with large tumors or patients with tumors in extradrenal location. Gallium 68 dotate is an expensive study. It may not always be available. So alternatives include indium 111 pentatriotide for head and neck paragangliomas and F18 FDG PET CT for metastasis. Finally, Theranostics, which entails a more lethal peptide receptor mediated radionuclide such as I131, MIBG, or lutetium 177 dotatate, may be beneficial in patients with advanced paragangliomas or progressive metastatic disease, with recent studies showing more than 80% partial response or sable disease over the past over the course of 12 months. So for future directions, um, prospective studies will need to clarify the role of theranostics as well as further elucidate the molecular clusters of paragangliomas, including the molecular basis of head and neck paragangliomas, which have largely been excluded from genetic profiling studies. MR spectroscopy, which has shown to be relatively sensitive in detecting a succinate peak at 2.4 parts per million may have potential for providing a non-invasive means of detecting SDH mutations in patients with paragangliomas. MR spectroscopy in the head and neck and abdomen, however, is technically challenging and prone to susceptibility artifact from adipose tissue, air and bone interfaces, as well as motion artifact. Thus, the utility of MR spectroscopy also needs to be verified with larger populations with techniques um, developed to improve ease of use. It's really interesting and just going back to the paper is it something that you had in the back of your mind to write? I mean what was your thought process behind putting this body of work together? Um, did you see the clinical impact of and why it was needed and then go about writing it or was it a subject matter that's quite close to your heart already? Sure. Um, well this paper was really a pandemic paper and a result of many events um, that occurred over the past uh, few years. Uh, one of which was first having a terrific and really smart colleague, Dr. Shanaz Elika, who is very well read and came across and shared with me this new molecular classification of paragangliomas. And this classification of paragangliomas was largely absent from radiology literature at the time. And uh, we found this something to be incredibly fascinating and thought, this would be a good project to work on. Um, and so a second event actually occurred um, while skiing in Big Sky, Montana. Um, and I was skiing there with Dr. Bennett Chin, whose wife happens to be a classmate and a great friend of my wife's. So Bennett is uh, currently division chief of nuclear medicine at the University of Colorado. And he has a great interest in neuroendocrine tumors and dotate imaging. He also happens to be the colleague of Dr. Lauren Fishbein, who turns out is an endocrinologist also at the University of Colorado and fortuitously specializes in neuroendocrine tumors. So Lauren conducted the most recent comprehensive cancer genome atlas program genetic study on periganglioma's. And uh, she has you know, many research projects that she has conducted with periganglioma's. So here I am, uh, looking for fresh powder in Big Sky, Montana. Yeah. And I end up finding instead, because there was no powder, um, an expert in the functional imaging and an expert in the endocrinology and genetics of paragangliomas. So both Bennett and Lauren um, graciously agreed to collaborate with me on this project. Um, and they generously devoted uh, much time, guidance, and expertise um, with this paper. And uh, I learned so much from them. So um, it's, it's just really 
great to have uh, colleagues and friends um, that, um, and I think a lot of this happens, you know, in the multidisciplinary um, area where you run into people from other areas, have interests that kind of cross paths um, and try to connect, kind of connect the dots, and so to speak. It sounds um, like the perfect mix of uh, just fortuitous events coming together. It was a fortuitous event and, and a lot of just um, talking about these um, uh, possible uh, projects um, together. Um, the other unfortunate event that really uh, pushed me to write this paper was um, the passing of my wife, Dr. Mina Chang, who was an ophthalmologist and retina specialist. I'm so sorry. Um, um, thanks. And um, she tragically died in a ski accident while we were in Italy, um, right as the pandemic was starting to hit the US. Um, so after I returned from Italy, um, I was trying to process all this grief and pain, uh, which was nearly impossible. And in the meantime, uh, the pandemic was just starting to peak in um, New York City um, and everything at work slow down because we were preparing for the worst and we were only scanning emergent patients. Um, and so all of our outpatients were put on hold. So suddenly um, I had all this time on my hands um, and work was actually, clinical work was actually quite slow uh, for the radiology department. And I decided that there was no better opportunity to transform uh, my pain and grief to something positive. Um, so it's just something that uh, kind of it's been a long process and it's something that kind of drove me um, to finish the project. This paper is almost a little bit in honor of her as well. So fast forward. Yeah, you know, we'd um, yes, go basically ahead. before this uh, podcast, we'd um, spoken about things that we'd like to talk about. And we, I knew none of this um, and you didn't tell me. So can I just say it's so incredible that you've gone through probably the hardest and the worst pain anyone could imagine and you've somehow managed to focus your energies into producing a piece of work which most people wouldn't you know wouldn't be able to do so I'm just incredibly in awe of what you've achieved and I think should be very proud um, you've contributed to the scientific community um, and you know, there's a lot of people that are going to be reading this work and changing their practices and learning, reducing the knowledge space as a result. Um, and that's pretty amazing. Well, that's very uh, generous comments from you, Dr. Islam. Um, it, uh, I think when you're going through so much pain and grief and, and in many ways you don't really know, your mind is not really in a way capable of wrapping around it um, in the depth of, of the grief. Um, and uh, I think focusing on, on a, a project kind of helps you to not sort of ignore that um, pain and grief, but it, it kind of uh, gives you some focus um, in a way where your mind is really clouded um, because um, your reality has changed overnight. And um, so it's actually a really great thing. I mean, I think the other thing that happened during the pandemic was I, I actually played a lot of music because my wife and I played music together a lot. Um, and, um, and so it was kind of my way of reconnecting with her as well. And, and uh, I never had, in a way, this luxury of time yeah. Um, just for at least a month or two to play music. So I think that luxury time is, is and you know, especially now when I, I can't even, you know, <laughs> keep my head above, above water sometimes, you know, because it's so busy. Um, but that luxury of time was, was in a way fortuitous um, for me to deal with um, this grieving process, but also um, a way to be productive and, and focus on, on something. It's an incredible achievement to do it under the circumstances that you're doing it, but also just using the grieving process to refocus your mind and 
use the paper as a way to really, you know, focus your energies into something productive and meaningful, giving back to the scientific community under the, the worst circumstances. Um, one of the things that we really um, admire in, and we look for in papers when we're reviewing uh, submissions for imaging cancer is the quality of the figures. Um, and, you know, we're all radiologists and we look at pictures all day and sometimes we get papers, but image pictures just aren't very good. And when you're working in an area like paragangliomas, does it help having a collaborative network of institutions that also image paragangliomas so you can curate the best um, figures for a submission process? Or did they Absolutely. all come from your institution? Oh, no. Um, and, and in fact, that was a large part of the collaboration as well. Um, you know, um, Dr. Chin um, in Colorado, uh, being a nuclear medicine person, doing a lot of DOTA imaging, he had a lot of uh, great cases. So we kind of selected uh, the functional imaging images um, uh, from his institution. Um, a lot of the, uh, you know, we, we get a, a fair amount of paragangliomas. Um, and so a lot of the uh, more conventional imaging um, illustrations that we have um, uh, came from our institution. Um, I actually created a lot of the uh, uh, figures uh, for it um, in preparation for, for a lecture that I did. Also, um, fortuitously, uh, when I was at uh, RSNA uh, a few years ago, uh, I bumped into Dr. Toshio uh, Moritani um, who actually did his fellowship training initially at Rochester um, and was kept in touch. Um, and then he proceeded to uh, go to Iowa and then now he's in Michigan. And, um, and so we were uh, talking about um, uh, uh, paragangliomas and he also had a lot of interest in it too. Um, he actually had been uh, doing some more advanced um, MR spectroscopy uh, MR perfusion, and so uh, we were able to to uh, collaborate and get um, uh, images from his institution um, and his contribution from the uh, more advanced MR imaging. And so, um, because you know, we all have every institution has their strengths and weaknesses, and you know, um, you know, every institution is going to have areas where they really excel in, and then other areas. Uh, uh, where they they may not have as much material, so it's really great to have a collaborative network um, and to know people. And I think that's one of the great parts about going to these national and international conferences um, is that you're able to um, uh, talk to other people about the stuff that you're doing and and potentially uh, collaborate across institutions. And I think it's a very it's always great to get a different perspective too clinical as well as imaging wise uh, from how people do things um, elsewhere. Yeah, I guess, um, you know, when the world went fully virtual, whilst, you know, we were looking at content of uh, conferences and whatnot, I guess you can never really quantify the impact of the in-person back channel conversations that you have with people when you just meet at conferences with a common interest and the collaborations that leads to, I think, oh, yeah. the scientific community really suffered as a result. And you know, hopefully we're now on the other side of that. Um, I just want to touch briefly on the submission process and your experience of it. You know, getting a paper from submission to actually seeing it in print and publications along and can sometimes be a torturous process. Um, how did you find it? Um, so this was a, a very, it was quite a marathon for this project. Um, and we went through many iterations um, and submissions, in fact, um, until we finally found the right home for this paper. Um, and getting this paper to where it is now um, took uh, so much collaboration from my co-authors. Um, and uh, I remember Lauren had told me after one of our rejections, um, that sometimes it's just difficult to find the right fit in audience. Um, but she said, you know, uh, keep on incorporating those comments, keep on trying. 
Um, so I, I will say for, for, you know, people who have worked really hard on a project and just keep getting turned down to just be patient and uh, humble um, and persistent. And the reviewers um, uh, provide a, a lot of invaluable uh, comments. And so um, we really need to listen to those comments and try to incorporate them into um, our papers. Um, we're trying to make it um, as good of a paper as it can um, because people have different perspectives uh, depending on their experience and knowledge. Um, and so it's, it's really great um, to see a paper from a different angle and, um, and incorporating those reviews and comments into the paper just makes it a, a stronger paper. So I think what you're seeing now as a final product went through through many, many um, iterations. And it, it was very frustrating at times, you know, but, you know, and sometimes you just kind of have to put things down and let it rest for, you know, a month and, and then get back to it and then see it with some fresh eyes um, and then try to find um, the right journal for it. It's not easy all the time. Well, we're very happy that um, our journal is a home for your work and we hope that it has the reach um, that it deserves um, for this piece of work. Um, but I know you're very busy. I've kept you from your reading list, but can I just say um, it's been incredibly humbling um, to hear your personal story. Um, I had no idea before we recorded this session um, at all um, that you should be very proud. I think, as I say, under the worst circumstances, you've managed to create something really amazing and you shared your personal story and I hope other people can draw inspiration from that and continue to go forward in their careers and continue to work in difficult circumstances you should be very proud of yourself I think you've done an amazing honor to your late wife your colleagues should be proud of you we've just met and I just think you're amazing and on that note I'd like to uh just thank you once again from everyone on behalf of the Radiology Imaging Cancer Editorial Board. Thank you for choosing us as a home for this piece of work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Islam. That is very um, generous comments again uh, from you. And um, thank you to the editorial board again. Um, it's actually an incredible honor to be able to publish in, in your journal. Um, it's a terrific journal. And uh, thank you again for this opportunity. This concludes today's episode. I want to join Shah in expressing my deepest sympathy to Dr. Lin and my utmost gratitude for sharing his personal story with us today. I'm sure that his work has inspired many of us, and I look forward to continuing following his work in the future. Thank you all for listening, and we look forward to your feedback via email or on Twitter. I'm Dr. Jana Ivanitsin, and this is Radiology Imaging Cancer.